Ladies and gentlemen, from the State Public Sector, Senior Management Council of the State Government of South Australia, the Institute of Public Administration, IPAA, IPA, members and partners, the Social Capital Thinker in Residence partners, all welcome to this showcase event. My name is Rob DeMonte, I'm Chair of the Thinkers Program and delightfully your MC for today. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge this land that we meet on today is the traditional land of the Ghana people and we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. So we have a wonderful program for you today uh, and that's come together with the help of a lot of people. So I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of the Don Dunstan Foundation along with IPA SA for collaborating to bring this event to you today. I'd like to thank the many partners in the Thinkers program and particularly Deloitte and Careers SA who are sponsoring partners for, for this event. Also I'd like to welcome Chief Executives from State Government, representatives from PwC and Flinders University. These organisations are IPA's SA's partners and they help us make these events possible. I'd like to thank our impressive and distinguished speakers and in a moment you'll hear who we have on board today. I'd like to remind everyone that if there is an emergency and we need to evacuate, you don't go on the oval, you follow the staff as they lead you outside uh, and don't use the lifts. Uh, videos of previous showcases are all available on YouTube and this one will also be filmed, hence the cameras everywhere, and made available to, to view on IPA's SA's YouTube channel. And that can be accessed from WIPA's website, IPA's website. Wow, that's a mouthful. So to begin, uh, let me introduce you to Taylor Power-Smith, who will give us a welcome to country. Nankana me yo na kaono alia napula alia yung and talia yakin and talia kuma. Nanari Taylor Tipu Power Smith, Yalaka nai pani night to taikatina pitiku wangandi. Nadlu gana me yuna, kama me pa yama yama, night to mankalankala, yacha me yunaku. Night cha nadli wada tiakati, matu echanga, night to kama me, night cha kuma. Night chalia. Ladies and gentlemen, uncles, aunties, brothers and sisters, namani. Are you all good? So in Ghana, when I say Naamani, if you're good, you would say Mani I. So Naamani? Beautiful. Today we are meeting on sacred Ghana land. We pay our respects to all the Ghana that are, all the Ghana that were, and all the Ghana that will be. We pay our respects to all of our elders, both black and white. My name is Taylor Tipu Power Smith. Tipu in Ghana means a spark, and I was given that name after my mother, Katrina, Galabina Power. Galabina means a lover of fire. Let us sit and talk together, let us eat and drink together, let us sing and dance together. Let us laugh and cry together so that our children and our children's children can feel the wind and the breeze, find shelter in the storm and sunshine in the rain. But most importantly, so that they can feel the warmth of a new campfire that we have created for them. I would like to acknowledge and pay special respects to two idols of mine who I recently lost, my dear Aunty Alicia Rigney and my dear Uncle Stephen Goldsmith. These warriors paved the way for me and my generation and it's because of them that I even have the courage to be standing up here today. I'll forever worship the sacred ground that they walked on and as a tribute to them, I would like to teach you a little song in Ghana and I hope that we can sing it all together. It's really easy, so you can all repeat after me. Nina Mani. Mani I. Wanti Nina. Wadliana. It's as easy as that, and it literally means, hello, how are you? I'm good, where are you going? I'm going home. So it's repeated like that. So if I sing it, and just as a courtesy, I'm a very terrible singer. <laughs> so if I sing it, can we all sing it back loudly and proudly, please? Yeah? yeah. All right, cool. So just repeat after me. Nina Mani. Nina Mani. Mani I. Mani I. Nina. Wadliana. Beautiful. Can we do it one more time, just a little bit louder though? Yeah? 
Thank you. It really means a lot to me and it means so much to Annie and Uncle Steve as well. So, Nina Mani. Nina Mani. Mani I. Wanti Nina. Wadli Anna. Thank you very much. Another word I want to teach you is nakara, which means I'll see you later. But before I say that, I'll just say mani nabudni Ghana yatana, which means welcome to Ghana country, and nakara. Beautiful. And please, if you remember any of the language you've learned today, please share it because I want my language to be around forever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taylor. So let's start with the CEO of the Dunstan Foundation, David Pearson. He's going to provide us a, a bit of an overview of what's going to happen in the next hour or so. David. Thank you, Rob, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, can I too start by acknowledging the traditional land on which we meet today, the land of the Ghana people, and Kira for that one, that special welcome to country. Um, can I also acknowledge all the partners in the social capital residencies? We wouldn't be here today if you hadn't been um, so willing to support the process that we're undergoing. So my heartfelt thanks to all of those partners who are in the room today. Well, we're here for the first public event as part of Alison Hewitt's uh, second residency's visit to Adelaide. Um, in May this year, Alison visited for the first time and engaged with 1,200 people uh, through 11 roundtables, 54 meetings and a series of presentations and, and four public events all in three weeks. So we worked pretty hard last time. We've got a pretty ambitious program for Alison's second visit. Um, and her visit here marked the relaunch of the Thinkers in Residence program here in South Australia. And beginning of a two-year process, the social capital residencies. And we have an ever-growing number of partners in that process with some very bold ambitions. But today, I really wanted to give you some background and context of why we're here, to tell you who we're going to hear about, and really to make two simple points. One, that our economic future as a state lies in our ability to realise the opportunities that exist in what we're calling the purpose economy. And two, that South Australia can rightfully claim a leadership and role in that purpose economy. So those two arguments were the starting point of these residencies, and I think they're resonating and in the ever-growing number of partners that we have in this program. So in terms of background, we're here for a number of reasons, but probably most importantly because the Dunstan Foundation Board and Lynn, my chair, who's here today, took the decision to re-establish the Thinkers Program under the auspices of the Dunstan Foundation. Now, we're a thought leadership organisation. We work on collaborative projects aimed at inspiring action for a fairer world, and our work seeks to build on the legacy of our founder, the late Premier Don Dunstan. We're supported by the Universities of Adelaide and Flinders University and the South Australian Government, and we focus our efforts on five key areas, mental health, homelessness, and we've launched a new project, the Adelaide Zero Project, to, to deal with um, rough sleeping homelessness in the city, and you'll find a discussion paper on your tables, uh, Aboriginal economic development and reconciliation, migration, and examining new ways of enhancing community development and participation, of which we're focused the Thinkers Program on. And as you may know, earlier this year we relaunched the Thinkers Program, which was originally run by the South Australian Government, um, largely on behalf of the South Australian Government. And today we've shaken up the model a little bit. We're now got, it's now run by the Foundation on behalf of all the partners in the process, many of whom, we, as I said, are here today. And the old model would have one thinker and one issue. And we've changed that so that there is one issue, how do we grow the social economy or the purpose economy? Um, but with a number of thinkers supporting that goal. And Alison Hewitt's our primary thinker in residence. This is her second visit. Um, Susie Souza was our first specialist thinker in residence. She came for Entrepreneurs Week earlier in the year. And later this year, we're working with the Economic Development Board and set the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute to bring Vic Strecker, um, our another specialist thinker in residence, out. So each visit is marked by a number of activities. A showcase like this to highlight the great success stories, the challenges, and the opportunities in the purpose economy for South Australia. Round tables with industries, organisations and, an, and a range of others that, about what's working and what isn't working and to help Alison understand and perform and to develop her advice for us. A number of workshops to help map the social innovation ecosystem that are led by TAXI, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, and meetings with all our partners to take all the words and the activities and the thought leadership work that we're doing and turn that into action through prototype initiatives. Finally, it finishes with a final oration. Uh, that's what we learnt, what Alison's hurt, and with a report that follows that that makes recommendations to all of those involved in the residencies. Now, traditionally with the Thinkers Program, um, that advice was directed to state government at the end of the process. We flipped that around and the advice now goes to all of us that are involved and also to make recommendations as we go. 
One of the recommendations in Alison's first um, report was that we should celebrate the successes and the, ex the stories of success and excellence in South Australia. And these showcases an opportunity to do just that. So simply by being here today, you're helping to implement the recommendations of the Thinkers program by celebrating what is great about South Australia and the work that some of us are doing and sharing the stories of ex excellence, as Alison called it. During Alison's first visit, we held a showcase just like this one, and at the beginning we had a briefing from the Office of the Chief Economist in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, who told us that the single largest growing part of South Australia's economy in terms of jobs uh, is the purpose economy. Today we'll receive another economic briefing from Aaron Hill, the head of Deloitte Access Economics um, in South Australia, and he will share his take on South Australia's economy and some of the work that Deloitte are doing to support it. The first showcase also had a series of mini TEDx style presentations, and we'll have those again today. And it's from organisations that are working in the purpose economy. At the last showcase we heard from the New Ventures Institute, uh, that found after they looked at the startups that they'd supported and how um, those that were working with a social purpose were actually much more successful and much more likely to survive through the tough times of being an entrepreneur and commercialising an idea if they had purpose at the heart of the business model, more so than those that were just motivated solely by profit. And that was um, one of the stories that uh, the New Ventures Institute shared. We heard about the opportunities of becoming a B Corp or for benefit certified company from Lee May, who runs a B Corp called Dirt Built in South Australia. And we heard about the challenges faced by social enterprises um, and that it's not all um, beer and skittles, as I called it at the time, that CBS said how hard it had been for them um, to set up a social enterprise for people living with a disability running a concierge service and how they've had to shut that service down, but what they learned through that process. So the videos for all of those presentations are available on the IPA website and the Dunstan YouTube channel and I encourage you to check them out. But today, we have a great lineup, just like last time, of organisations working in the Perkins economy who are willing to share their stories, their challenges, and the opportunities as they see them. So in returning to what I was saying earlier about the uh, economic future for South Australia and our state, we are undoubtedly going through a massive transition in South Australia. All economies around the world are facing very similar challenges. The loss of the automotive industry will provide a very significant challenge for us, and those effects are already being felt. But don't be fooled, I would argue, by the negativity that too often surrounds the discussions about our economy here in South Australia. We've consistently been creating more jobs than we've lost, and we currently have the second lowest um, rate of unemployment in the country. Um, the fastest growing sector of our economy in terms of jobs, measured by jobs, not by profit, are the social purpose of parts of that economy. And in this context, I refer to that as being the care, the social assistance, education, health and creative sectors. And I think there's great opportunities in working more, those sectors working more closely with the tech and professional services sector to grow even further. So Aaron will talk more, as I said, about the creation of jobs in our economy and where that's occurring. But I think it's important to remember that the single largest job creator in our northern suburbs, where the effects of Holden's closure will be felt most acutely, will be the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So one of our speakers today is Dermot from the Stretton Centre, who will present about the work he's doing to support the creation and the growth of jobs in the purpose economy in Northern Adelaide. But what I want to highlight is that the social economy is serious business, that there are some big companies in South Australia who are working in it. Many of our biggest companies, both measured in turnover and employees, are not-for-profit organisations. And we'll hear from a few of those later on, those that are working to transform their own organisations. So we'll hear from Sharon from Meals on Wheels and Catherine from the Royal Society for the Blind. Um, but it's not just about the social services sector. Uh, in our last visit, Kirk Drage, the entrepreneur in residence at the Adelaide City Council, told Alison and I about some work uh, that he'd been involved with in the UK that showed that SMEs, or small to medium-sized enterprises, that had a social purpose, had a faster growth rate, and a greater rate of return for their investors than those that did not. And we're an SME town. There are huge opportunities here. Co cooperatives are a big part of the South Australian story as well. And a colleague of mine at Green Industries recently shared with me a study from France that showed that cooperative startups are much more likely to succeed than those traditional business models. In fact, th this study found that 90% of co-ops were still in business five years later compared to just three to 5% of um, startups that didn't have that cooperative model. What it highlights for me is that diversity is important, both in our business models, but also in how we work and where we work and who we work with. So shortly we'll hear from um, Sam Moore from Bendigo Bank about a different type of business model that they've worked in with community banking. We'll also hear from Moira Deslands, who um, will talk to us about the work she's doing in support of greater diversity in um, the startup scene uh, through her organisation, Chooks. Uh, 
I, I thought it was important to have someone like Moira talk about that work after I read a report recently that showed that uh, not only, which is something we've obviously known for a while, that diversity is a, is a driver of economic growth, but that also it's incredibly important and it's one of the most um, important factors in uh, breeding a culture of creativity and innovation. And if you think about what we need as a future as a state, creativity and innovation are at the heart of that and so diversity must be too. So the evidence suggests supports what we're talking about here today, but knowing these things and doing something about it are different. The concepts of inclusive growth and inclusive innovation uh, are something that Alison's incredibly passionate about and spoke about on her last visit and we'll talk more about today and over the next three weeks. So I tell you these things to highlight that the economy is changing globally, nationally and locally. We want to live and work, we want to consume and invest our values now more than ever. We want to co-work, we want to share, we want to cooperate, not endlessly compete, and we want to have purpose in our lives. And these are the common themes throughout these residencies. Susie Souza was our specialist thinker in residence and really powerfully conveyed a number of these facts when she talked about the trends that are apparent in the different generations in our society. And with that trend of wanting to work in those ways and live in those ways, much more apparent or the most obviously apparent in the millennials generation. And she highlighted that for the first time, Deloitte released a report a few years ago that showed millennials thought the number one purpose of business was to improve society. Millennials represent what is changing about our economy. It's something that's apparent, of course, across all generations, but highlighted there. And millennials are the future. By 2025, they will make up 75% of the global workforce. So South Australia has massive opportunities in this space, but we also have to be honest about the challenges. According to the work that Aaron's done at Deloitte and their Make It Big report, there are now fewer millennials living in South Australia than there were in the 1980s. This is a trend we must turn around. And as a millennial myself, uh, you know, that, that, that's had an impact. The, the, all of my friends who I went through university have all left. Um, some of them have come back. Aaron and I have, uh, you know, one of the few of the people who went un through university together that are still here in Adelaide. And we both left and came back. But we need to get more to come back as well. I digress. So if the purpose economy is a big economic opportunity for South Australia, I'd like to make one final point, And that, that, that is that we are leaders in this space and that we are best placed to take advantage of those opportunities. In today's world, people can live and work anywhere. They want to work with people who share their values and they want to live in communities that are livable. This is something we have in Adelaide in spades. Just, you can't look out the windows now, but you all walked in with that lovely day we're having out here today. It is an incredibly beautiful place. Um, we are rated as one of the most livable, consistently rated as one of the most livable cities in the world. We are safe, we are well planned, we have some of the most affordable housing in the country, we have clean air, clean food, clean water, amazing wine, we have great health system, great education system, we have the world's best festivals um, and we love them. We, have, we sell more festival tickets in South Australia, 50% of the nation's festival tickets are sold right here in Adelaide. Um, so we are a creative place, but we do need more jobs. And we, need a, and we need a new vision for our economy and where it's going. And so we are a socially progressive place and we've never wanted to leave our fellow citizens behind and that's where these things come together. Towards the end of the Industrial Revolution in England, a group of idealists got together to establish the South Australian Company. And that was what became the, the colony of South Australia. We were formed because of a group of dreamers escaping industrial England, wanting to create a per more perfect society. And they didn't get everything right the way of the treatment of our first Australians, one of the things that are most evident in that. But what they did do was set a bold ambition for the place that we now call home. And while we're seeking to avoid the downside, while they were seeking to avoid the downsides of one industrial revolution, today we find ourselves in the midst of a number of technological revolutions. The impact of automotion, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, virtual reality, robotics, and many more. We have our own industrial revolutions going on right now, and we should recommit ourselves to the founding purpose of what our colony was about, to use this change to drive a better society. And this reform aim has been strong throughout South Australia's history. Our willingness to innovate is in our DNA. So the aim of these residencies, these social capital residencies, is for South Australia's founding purpose to be a better society, is to build on South Australia's founding purpose to be a better society, while addressing our most contemporary need, job creation. 
The ultimate purpose, and hence the name, is for South Australia to be as well known for social innovation as other places around the world are known for what they do. Geneva and diplomacy, Tamworth and country music, whatever the analogy you'd like to use. But we want Adelaide to truly be the social capital of Australia. And to do that, we need your help. So that's what we're here for today, to learn more and to use this um, showcase event is our attempt at making the case that we already are the social capital and that we lead in so many ways. So I encourage you to learn, to, to network here today to partner with the organisations that are um, in, involved with these residencies and encourage you to, um, to really get involved. The Dunstan Foundation exists to inspire action for a fairer world and it's our hope today that this showcase inspires you to do just that. Thanks very much for being here. Wonderful, beautiful setup for the day and very powerfully uh, spoken. Well done. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Aaron Hill, um, and if Aaron can take to the stage. Aaron leads the Deloitte Access Economics Practice in Adelaide. In addition to his passion for the South Australian economy, and obviously a, a, a good mates with uh, the CEO of the Dunstan Foundation, um, Aaron is part of Deloitte's national team and has delivered advice on technology economics to clients like Airbnb, Uber, and the economics of cities and urban policy to Commonwealth and state governments. And a really nice touch is that Alan, Aaron lives in Adelaide's southwest corner with his wife, Stephanie. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Rob. Um, and I'd like to start as well by acknowledging the Ghana people as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. It's great to be here today at the second most exciting event at Adelaide Oval this week. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about isn't actually that dissimilar. It's about how Adelaide can come at the top of the table economically as well as um, in the AFL uh, once again, even if uh, sometimes it feels like um, we're kicking into the wind. And we've been feeling like we've been kicking in the wind for some time. Frankly, since the end of the 1980s, we've faced really significant economic challenges in South Australia. We've been shrinking as a proportion of uh, national growth and as we can see uh, on, on these charts over the last um, five years and for the four years into the four decimates going forward, um, we've seen a sustained period of uh, under-trend or sub-trend growth um, which has been very challenging for the economy. Last year in 2016-17 was particularly challenging. Um, in demand terms there was um, some improvement um, and that we're, seeing, uh, that we're seeing in retail trade which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but, and we're already seeing some improvement into 2017-18. Go, going forward, um, we think that a lot of the economic transition in South Australia will be actually bolstered by um, lower um, the Australian dollar and relatively low interest rates, which will mean that we'll see um, that growth tend to return to above um, the trend level, so about 2% uh, and above over the years in the four decimates. As David was talking about before, we're actually starting to see that in terms of um, the total number of jobs in South Australia, as well as a fall in the unemployment rate. While I don't think it's time to crack the champagne in terms of unemployment, I wouldn't count headline uh, chickens before um, they hatch. I think that uh, we would need to see um, a few more months of sustained trend unemployment growth um, before we start celebrating. I think that the, the, there is a sucker to be taken from the fact that we're, we have seen stable and steady rise in the number of jobs in South Australia. Um, I think that it's, I wouldn't get ahead of ourselves with this. I don't think that this is something that's locked in. We will have the closure of Holden um, coming up over the next quarter as well as um, much of the exit of the, the car manufacturing industry which surrounds it. Having said that, I think that the way that the South Australian economy has responded to, to these challenges does tend to indicate that there is services sector strength. One place that we're starting to see that is retail trade. The retail trade over the last uh, few months um, has been significantly stronger than in the rest of the country. Um, we're seeing South Australia outstrip, a, a, outstrip retail trade growth and turnover by about a percentage point. What that tends to suggest is that there is a returning confidence, especially among consumers. And it also reflects some of the growth that we've seen in the tourism sector and in the international education sector, both of which are relatively strong. 
As Dave pointed out, and, and, I've, and Matt uh, Winefield, um, when he gave his presentation, uh, talked about the, the number of jobs in the purpose sector in South Australia, and, and I wanted to draw a slightly different but adjacent point, which is about around what we call in economics value added. Essentially, um, it's, it's not quite profit, but it's essentially the, the value that different parts of the economy um, make relative to each other. This is a chart that we often talk about in terms of the challenges that we face in South Australia. What it shows is that if you compare the way that our economy performs on a per person basis, so adjusting for population, compared to Victoria, we're a little behind in the development of our um, professional services and, and um, in information technology sectors. So we've got significant challenges and room to catch up there. Having said that, the other thing that it points out is that we outperform in terms of healthcare and social assistance. And too often, this is seen as exclusively a challenge. It is a challenge in some ways. It does, it's a challenge for governments fiscally, but it's also a considerable opportunity for the South Australian economy. If we can deliver answers to the challenges that we face, we can build a sustainable, exportable services sector that um, will de both delivers on an important public purpose and creates significant opportunities for our, um, for our economy going forward um, for both employment and for profit making ultimately, even as, um, even as, as we pursue a, a purpose agenda um, through ideas like mutuals and B Corps. And I wanted to point to um, one part of the economy um, uh, that is, and one part of our community that's particularly close to my heart. I, I grew up in the northern suburbs and as David pointed out, there are significant challenges there. And, there's, and I think that um, the, um, as, and as David pointed out before, he um, stole my point, um, that uh, the, there's enormous opportunity that we can have from uh, thing, things like the National Disability Insurance Scheme in bridging the trends that we have um, between Northern Adelaide and the rest of Adelaide and Northern Adelaide and the rest of South Australia by creating new jobs um, while delivering on a social purpose, um, which is ultimately um, making sure that people with disabilities enjoy the same rights as all of the rest of us do to participate in our community. The point that um, I wanted to make to close um, uh, this uh, discussion uh, stems from um, as David pointed out, Sam, the fact that neither of us have any friends left in Adelaide anymore, um, other than each other. No, that's not quite true. But uh, the, South Australia has real demographic challenges. We, we have real um, difficulties in terms of the number of people who are aged between 15 and 35 living in the state. Um, now, of course, um, young people have no particular wisdom or experience. Um, that means that they're particularly brilliant entrepreneurs or anything like that. That's all just a, a bit of a myth generated in Silicon Valley. The truth is most entrepreneurs, the, the median age is 45. So there, there's no particular magic that comes with having young people. Unfortunately, the, the one thing that does come with having young people is that young people are the ones who choose to form families. And so if you don't have um, sufficient numbers of young people in your state, natural population growth and, and the ultimate size and number of people who choose to live in this state uh, will fall. And what we've seen in um, this particular forecast, which um, we shared, is that unless we act to, to grow the number of young people in particular who choose either to stay in or to move to South Australia, that we'll see natural population growth fall to almost zero by about the mid-2030s. At Deloitte, as, as David alluded to, we think that um, South Australia can have a really vibrant future. Um, we, we don't believe, I guess, in some of the... The, the, the rhetoric that um, goes around about the future of South Australia is a bit of a basket case. It's not supported by the economics and it's not supported by the data. Um, there are real challenges that we must face and confront though. The, and, but we believe that um, ultimately those challenges can be confronted that we can, and that we can change our economy so that we um, can claim a stake in uh, what our nation's economic prosperity looks like going forward. We think that we need to make a more compelling case to people to choose to live in South Australia. I think that the purpose economy is a really important opportunity for how we can do that. It means that we can give um, millennials, who, as David said, are uh, more and more likely to choose to want to work in places that have a purpose as well as for profit. Part of the reason I do what I do in talking about the economy, some of the people would say that's pretty dry, and to some people it probably is. But I think that I can have a purpose um, in talking about these issues and talking about uh, a broader set of issues um, as an economist than may have been traditionally done. 
And that's part of what drives me, and that's part of what drives my work and the work of my team. But we have to make sure that we stake that claim, and we have to make sure that we make that case. Um, I'll put in a quick plug before I go for what the con contribution that my firm's making um, as part of that. Um, we're putting together a, a process called Make It Big Adelaide, um, whereby we're bringing together people from business, the community sector, uh, and government to talk about the real ideas for how we can change South Australia's economy going forward. Um, some of those you may have seen in the paper on Friday, they're big ideas in terms of infrastructure, but they're also big ideas about how we can change our economy in terms of how the things that we produce and how we live and the people who we sell to. Um, I'm really excited about it. I really encourage you to get involved if you haven't already. We've already had hundreds of people um, get involved from across the state. Um, it, the website is uh, deloitte.com.au slash makeradelaide. I really look forward to hearing from you. And I really look forward to making sure that we have a purpose-driven um, economy as part of South Australia's economic future. Uh, I look, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. And I'd like to reinforce one point around uh, job, the job question and, and uh, what NDIS might bring with another hat that I have. Um, and that is, and, and some of you may or may not be aware that in the next couple of years, there will be a need for 10,000 more people in South Australia to work in the India, in disabilities in that sector. So there is a, a, a very large pipeline of jobs available if we can get our act together. So our next speaker, I'd like to uh, introduce Sam Moore, if Sam could come to the lectern. Sam is head of community bank model development at Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. Sam is uh, responsible for business development across the group's shared value business models, uh, community bank and alliance bank, as well as the stakeholder, as well as stakeholder engagement on shared value, environmental and social outcomes. Sam has led the bank's uh, participation in the creating shared value discussion, including strategy development and execution, delivering uh, the bank's innovative social impact loan program in 2016. Sam has a wealth of experience in the banking industry, both in commercial management roles as a qualified lawyer. In over 10 years with Bendigo, he's held a variety of senior management executive and director positions across both debt and equity portfolio strategy, as well as leadership roles in its rural banking business. Welcome, Sam. Uh, thanks very much, Robin. Thanks very much for having me here today. Um, uh, so what are these business models? What are these shared value um, business models? Um, we have one called Community Bank, uh, and that's our um, leading shared value business model. Uh, essentially, we offer banking products and services through community-owned social enterprises, uh, and we've been doing that for about 20 years, since 1998. Um, today, we have over 320 of these community-owned social enterprises that we work in partnership with uh, throughout Australia. Um, and they're social enterprises that are formed specifically to offer banking products and services and to put about 80% of their, bank, uh, their profits uh, back into community for community building, community strengthening, community prosperity purposes that they uh, determine. Um, they've got constitutional and government support frameworks which help to support that purpose. Uh, they're uh, governed by local volunteer directors, um, and they have cooperative uh, characteristics, so things like one shareholder, one vote, not one share, one vote. Um, restrictions on dividends, as I said, 80% of profits have to go back into local community. Um, and they, uh, the only shareholders that can, uh, that can buy shares in these local companies are locals, people that have a community connection. Um, and after 20 years of operating, they've put back about $165 million uh, back into community. Now, if you're like most people and if you're like me, um, you may be thinking, what's the catch? Or why didn't I know about this before? Um, and our local staff, uh, local customers, have recently created some videos. Um, and I just wanted to share one with you to illustrate uh, the sorts of uh, outcomes and impact uh, that this can have in the communities. Oh, 
already. What your business actually does. Oh, they had a ball. Yeah, it was their birthday yesterday too. Oh, I just got a comment that came up, Carol. It's got here, it looks like you've built a lot of change from backing with us. Do you want to see the change? Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, get it. Carol? Yeah? Can you just pop out for a sec? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your support to uh, the North Park Football Netball Club. Uh, six years, $60,000, thank that you. That is amazing. Really, you've helped us in maintaining our record of no lives lost between the flags. We've been lucky enough to receive forty or $50,000 in the community grant, yeah. and it's made the club really what it is today. We work with local high school students, and we can't do it without the support of the bank, and we can't do it without the support of you, so thank you. They've sponsored us for around about $150,000. Thank you for banking at Bendigo Bank. Your support helps me to play netball with my friends. <laughs> they actually um, donated a lot of money towards a skate park and just on behalf of all riders in Mackay and Serena, young and old, thank you. I'm here to, uh, to thank you on behalf of the Serena Men's Shed. You are supporting us. Without the uh, community bank who's given us upwards of $80,000, we've probably stopped at least five suicides and we keep a lot of men out of hospital. Oh, my <laughs> name's Paul. Yeah. The Bendigo Bank at Bunyip supplied a defib machine to the golf course. I died. Oh, wow. Playing golf. And the um, defib machine was put in use and saved my life. Oh, I'll just stop it there, I'm sorry, because there's... Thank you. We're a bit pressed for time, so um, you can see the rest of that if you like. Uh, who's that guy? Um, I put him up because uh, it's Michael Wee Porter. He's a um, Harvard professor, and he talked about, um, in a business uh, article that he wrote in Harvard Business Review, about this way of doing business, and it's called Creating Shared Value. Um, and not long ago, his uh, co-author, uh, a guy called Mark Kramer, uh, my ticker's not working, but um, uh, talked about our community bank model uh, and said that um, you know, Bendigo Bank's one of these troublesome companies that was doing shared value long before we started talking about it. Um, just acknowledging that that really is the way that we go about business. Um, and recently, that community bank model was recognised in Fortune magazine um, in its top 50 companies around the world uh, that are changing the world. Uh, we were number 13 on that list. So it's not just a business strategy, but really creating shared value is for any enterprise. Uh, for not-for-profits as well, and it's really about getting you to examine what you're good at and how you can collaborate with others um, to achieve what you're setting out to achieve. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sam. Very inspiring. Our next speaker is uh, Catherine Galina. She's coming to the stage. Excellent. Catherine um, with, has over 20 years' experience in people and culture across private, public and not-for-profit. Catherine is trusted as a strong, passionate and authentic leader with a broad spectrum of knowledge to assist in any business setting. Catherine's vast understanding of corporate governance, along with her business acumen, has seen her undertake major organisational redesign and transformational change projects, along with her starting up her own HROD consulting and children education business. Don't know where you get the time. Catherine is passionate about helping individuals, teams and organisations identify their strengths, challenge their way of thinking to work and uncover the potential from within. Catherine is currently the Executive Manager of People and Transformation at the Royal Society for the Blind and has designed a program of work to assist the South Australian icon navigate disruptive change and embrace growth opportunities. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share a piece of, I guess, the RSB's transformation agenda today. Entitled Brave, Bold and Vanilla, um, it provides a snapshot of where we have taken bold steps and backed ourselves to ignite sustainable change. We've had to step out of our comfort zone 
And uh, all the while, we've also decided to opt into some vanilla standard options in order to um, stay on track and not reinvent or customise. RSB as an organisation has showed me that they have the willingness and to open their hearts and minds to looking at doing work differently. And I'm proud to share a glimpse of our story thus far. Transformation requires... Oops. Not working. Transformation requires a transition from current to future state. And often the one thing that is forgotten is there's a need for us to get an understanding of our reality. And the reality for RSB was that we were an old infrastructure. Um, we'd been around for over 130 years. There was limited investment in our people um, and there were issues around our data integrity and there was reduced revenue that was coming at us like a train with the changes in the government reforms. And obviously we we're an organisation that was built on tradition um, as a not-for-profit model. Thank you. Um, our foundations needed to be stronger to enable us to transform and be agile. This transformation needed to not only design a new future state, but needed to put in place some contemporary fundamentals. We needed to invest in the unknown, and we needed to be bold and change our in internal voice to what were the possibilities. What if we asked our customers about what they wanted? What if we engaged our workforce and empowered and trusted them to have a say in our future design so that we could service our customers better? And what if we partnered and collaborated with organisations outside of our sector to co-create new business models? No longer could we see ourselves as less worthy or less capable in the not-for-profit sector. Our time to position ourselves and reposition ourselves, sorry, in business was now. And our mindset needed to be shaken up from the inside out. What good is an external brand if it did not reflect um, the realities of our people working within the business? So where does it go? I mean, one of the things that's brought me back to the not-for-profit sector is the fact that within that sector, there's a really strong purpose. But we needed to leverage our strengths. We needed to understand our why. We needed to become a sustainable business to make a difference in the lives of our many clients and their families. Our why was to design a future state that would get us back in the game to survive and strive. We were already behind the eight ball and the pathways for transformation would need to create momentum and our success would lay in the ability to connect with our employees and our customers. So Project Accelerate was born and I'm pleased to have a, a few members of my team here today. Um, they were recruited based on, I guess, an ability to believe that the impossible was possible and the project team have led the design and development of the change agenda. They've considered new processes, systems, tools, they've designed new roles, and along the way they've checkled, tackled the normal genders of change, resistance, and I guess the many customs and practices that are born out of an organisation that's over 130 years old. The team was designed around key streams of customer experience, discipline integration, and systems and process, and we actually needed to improve our business development, marketing, and change management ethos and support. Although the government reforms were the impetus for the change, we just didn't want to squeeze the doing work into what we were already doing. We had a unique opportunity, albeit in a very tight time frame, to start again. To roll out by roll out, the team could create a new customer journey that would map and support new levels of customer experience and also support the business to become more sustainable. We've already achieved in six months a new customer experience map and embedded in that new roles and experiences for our customers. And this has been supported by, I guess, a need to really upskill um, the level of our leadership capability to make everybody accountable for our customers. We've had to engage in understanding our customers more, actually get out and get to know them and understand what was their impacts in life and what were their pains. We've had to continue to empower our front line, so we've rolled out quite extensive customer first training, but also most importantly empowered them to make the decisions at the coalface that needed to be made in the benefit of customer. And we've introduced the metrics that matter. With, vis with visibility, there is accountability. So we've dared to untap an inner innovator form from within. We've started an ideas innovation hub um, to try and identify as many, I guess, new revenue streams and opportunities in this new, unique position that we're in. Um, so in partnership with Business Models Inc, we've actually offered that to our employee group to actually support them to generate the future direction of our business and to create new revenue streams that are desirable, viable and feasible to be considered. 
We've invested heavily in professional development of our people um, and the major uplift we are already seeing and our people are feeling valued from the investment. And to add the vanilla, we have deliberately made decisions to implement standard CRM and payroll systems. We were not ready to jump from nothing to gold-plated, so a standard out-of-the-box solution will enable us to learn and understand what we need while still achieving a quality solution. By avoiding the temptation of customisation, we have fast-tracked system implementation at a reduced cost. Every effort has been made to extend development opportunities to our existing staff. However, we have not been afraid to seek the input of external parties to provide capability uplift while also developing our future knowledge and expertise. And we are pleased to say that we have been contacted to partner both nationally and internationally to co-create some future business opportunities for RSB. So it's been six months, um, a full steam ahead, but we've learnt some lessons already along the way. How important engaging with our customers are. The understanding their stories and their needs will improve our business. Do not assume that everyone sees or has the desire to see what could be. The journey needs to be unpacked and sometimes we need to develop resilience in the unknown. Leadership is integral. Middle managers play a vital role in reinforcing the new way. And the line between project work and business as usual is not a straight one. The culture change is possible, even within six months, if you choose to focus on the people, you listen, you empower, and you believe, and that you have the courage, to, along with the talent within your business, to be free to explore, make mistakes, grow, and develop, as that is truly where the change will happen. So just finally, we're approaching, as I said, the second phase, a six-month mark. And I guess we remain steadfast that this is what we will achieve from the journey. But there is still a long way to go. The distance between our big dreams and reality is called action. So in closing, we look forward to collaborating with many of you in the audience today. Keep an eye out for RSB as we continue to act bold, embrace brave, and add a touch of vanilla to get the job done. Thank you. Well done, Catherine. Thank you. Um, a strong message there about change leadership. Change leadership is critical to success, and, and we see it in spades. I'd like to introduce Moira Deslens. Uh, Moira is, has worked from the kitchen table to the cabinet table. She trained as a social worker in the 1980s, and her understanding of the relationship of private pain to public policy introduced her to systems work at scale through community mobilising, advocacy and politics. Her leadership roles include being Chief of Staff to the Minister of Education and Early Childhood, the then Minister uh, of Transport Planning, Science and Information Economy, the South Australian Government, CEO of Volunteering SA and NT, Global Executive Director of International Association for Public Participation. Moira is a non-executive company director of the international project management company Scope Global, and she runs her own consulting business primarily in facilitation and engagement. Her passion for equity drives her personal and public life and in May this year launched Chooks, a network for women innovators and entrepreneurs in startups and social enterprises. Chooks aspires to address the gender differ differential in investment for women innovators and entrepreneurs. Welcome, Moira. Nice to see you. Thank you, Rob. And good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here. We're going to start with a little piece of speculative fiction. So it's 2027, and you're all sort of 10 years older. And this is the story. Equity is a model for growth and gender equity was the low hanging fruit. So 10 years ago, South Australia set a 50-50 target, gender equity and investment for women and startups and social enterprises. The levers to get this result included changes in procurement policies, education to get more girls into STEM and coding, capital from venture capital to in impact investing, they set their own gender targets. 50% of women in all the boardrooms and around the cabinet table. Industry leaders, local and state governments set the foundations for these early wins by signing the panel pledge for gender balance at conferences and events. Councils and state entities added it actually as a criteria in tender documents for global conventions wanting to use their venues. After all, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Having women visible, publicly acclaimed, out front, all the time, 
no exceptions, made impact and is now the norm. The State Procurement Board set targets for social enterprises, B Corps and co-ops to win contracts. Business adjusted, eager to showcase their capabilities and gender credentials as part of their tradition to the purpose economy. A little tougher but achieved was getting more women out on the runway for startups. Tech smart Smart Mate and Tech Stars were the early adopters and got 50% of women into their second and third rounds. Research showed in 2017 you only needed half as much investment in female founded startups to double your money, so it was actually an easy sell. Collaborations between startups and social enterprises ignited change at scale. From nanotechnology for monitoring the well-being of remote populations through to home kitchens to creating nutritional meals for people with disabilities and their carers, these ideas started here, in fact, with some of the people in this very room today. It started with women and it started with investment. We digitised the Blue Book, pairing it with South Australia's world-class data link built and transferred knowledge about child development, established real-time data and brought agile funding and resource delivery when and where it was needed most. Consequently, South Australia became famous for its non-invasive early intervention approach to child protection. The Google 2017 class action was very helpful to the Equal Opportunity Commissioner. She was able to spur on the tech and creative industries who had always lagged behind the gender pay gap stakes. Leaders pointed to the economic truth. Diversity equals dollars. Diversity nurtures innovation and the early adopters' economic results spoke for themselves. If you want to know more about how South Australia got to gender equity, look around the town for those VR clips embedded in the landscape, telling stories of women innovators and entrepreneurs. Tap any leader and ask them how they got involved, what they did to contribute. It's been a collective effort, fueled by passion, good ideas, imagination, wisdom, trading and trust, built on relationships and in a spirit of generosity, fostered by women and men, who wanted to unlock and unleash the potential of South Australia. So back here now in 2017, while we're awaiting wins at football ovals and this kind of season that we're in, I certainly had no intention of starting a movement from my red couch on a Sunday night in Wollonga. Wonderful women, however, were telling me about sexism they were experiencing, the systems challenges they were having and getting their startup and social enterprise ideas translated into business. The more research I did, the more inequity I saw. The more conversations and listening I did, the more I got motivated. I started to fall for the problem. And now, like a hopeless, lovesick teenager, I'm unable to stop thinking about it, noticing gender inequity all around me. I set up a closed Facebook group to see if anyone else felt the same, and in May this year, with 100 members, Chooks was launched at the National Wine Centre, and I've been overwhelmed with the energy and activity. There are now over 600 people involved in this online self-organising community, and it's growing every day. In fact, I just checked it before, and it was 609. My commitment to Chooks is turning into something of now a serious relationship. Through the Facebook group, jobs and staff are finding each other. Collaborations are forming across industries and interests. Focus groups are testing products and services. Pathways to invent investors are being made. Peers in regional areas are connecting. Chooks are hosting monthly female founders conversations. Mentor matching has started. And me and a few others are offering policy advice, advocating and applying the gender lens to all kinds of matters. Chooks is rooted in our history and our potential. It's unapologetically South Australian. We have been world leaders for women over many, many generations, so why not this one too? Chooks is not a lab, it's not an accelerator, it's not an investor, it's a movement. Leading, driving and striving for inclusive entrepreneurships. And like all movements, Chooks converges culture, activism and knowledge. And with this momentum over the coming year, I expect that we'll become even more defined and probably grow into intermediary. So my message to you all is equity is a model for growth and it's necessary as we move to an on-purpose economy. It's the low-hanging fruit. 
So get on board, join Chooks, and in a spirit of uh, great collaboration and uh, cross-marketing, you can follow us there, and you can also walk the talk because we make the path by walking it and join with us in open state. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. I'm pleased to introduce Paul Reardon to the stage. Paul Reardon has worked in many different roles, both in government and private sector. Uh, as a private consultant for many years, Paul provided advisory and procurement services to a range of organisations, including state and local governments. Within government, Paul has held a number of senior positions, including responsibility for the delivery of a large part of the $404 million national nation-building economic stim stimulus program. Most recently, Paul was appointed Director of Northern Services, responsible for the management of over 25,000 housing SA tenancies and in the northern and western suburbs, together with tenancies on the York and Eyre Peninsula. Prior to this, Paul has had a range of responsibilities, including the new house construction program, specialised housing construction, including disability housing, Aboriginal and remote housing construction, maintenance strategy, and operations for 40,000 public housing assets a significant house sales program and leading housing SA's technical, professional and advisory services. Paul Reardon is also the current state manager for the emergency relief function service as part of the state's disaster management arrangements. Welcome, Paul. Thanks uh, very much, Rob. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about our local participation uh, broker trial program. Um, housing SA is, um, has uh, 37,000 head tenants uh, which, uh, which live in the, our homes, uh, totalling about 64,000 people. We've been concerned for some time... Um, sorry, I just need to work this. Oh. <laughs> sorry, how do we...? Sorry, sorry about that. Um, we've been concerned for some time about uh, our, our clients, our, our tenants, um, and the low level of social and economic participation that they have. Um, we've got really good access to our customers and we believe that as a result of that access, we're in a really good position to make a positive contribution to their lives um, and we're, we're thinking that through our local participation trial, we'll be able to do that. Uh, here is essentially the problem as we saw it. We have three in five of our tenants living below the poverty line. Um, then we have another one in five living with uh, what's called limited means, which is about $100 of the poverty line. So if you think about it, four-fifths of our tenants are very, very close to the poverty line or below the poverty line. Um, we um, also see that um, a very large percentage of our uh, clients are, are unemployed. Only 20% are employed. Um, in that region, in the northern region, which I'm responsible for, in the age groups of 16 to 64, 65% of them are unemployed. Compared that um, to the general population where 71% of the population are employed. So it's a significant difference for our tenants. A further two-fifths of our tenants are people living with a disability. And essentially we're talking about a group of people who are at real risk of long-term social and economic disadvantage. The trial area for our um, program is the Playford local government area, um, which is the most disadvantaged area in Adelaide and the fourth most disadvantaged area in South Australia. We reckon we could make a difference, so we, tried, we started an 18-month trial and we started last November. Um, and the aim of the trial is to increase our customers' access to and participation in the labour market. Last November, we employed to um, two service brokers. Um, the focus of the brokers is really to work one-on-one -on -one with clients, very much in a case management um, style. Clearly we're talking about thousands of customers and, and only two people, but, so it's quite a labour-intensive uh, exercise. But we are very um, hopeful that this one-on-one -on -one approach will actually lead to real, real results and try and help those people who are willing to uh, participate, uh, get into um, um, employment or at least uh, some, some level of social and economic participation. So far, the results have been encouraging. We've had uh, 30 participants in our case management approach. Um, a lot of them are on New Start and um, essentially we um, have so far, we've had about 15 people work successfully 
towards um, their employment goals. Two have completed some training and four are, in, are employed. And I just want to talk about um, one person in particular. Um, uh, her name is uh, Alison. I'm just going to show you a video. It's a great success story. Contact 121 is a call centre that runs our maintenance uh, area. Alison has been uh, unemployed for many years and uh, as a result of working with our contractor through a social procurement model, we've been able to deliver, uh, I think, for Alison uh, an extraordinary outcome, which is uh, regular employment, 25 to 35 hours uh, every week. And at this stage, she's leading the sales program in Contact 121. So um, I'll now just run the video. Thank you. I actually really loved the job. Um, at first I was a bit, it was a bit daunting, but now I love being there, the people are really good, and yeah, I enjoy going into work. I would say you need to be patient, and I would say that um, Sean has done as much as he can to find me a job, yeah. I don't know where I'd be now, I'd probably still be frustrated and angry because, you know, I've applied for so many jobs. Financially, I've benefited. I've been able to help um, buy extra things for my twins that have just been born and my other grandchildren. Um, I'm not so stressed about what I'm going to eat tomorrow because I know I've got money in the bank and I can go and buy myself a proper meal and have proper food in the house. And um, I'm not so stressed at how to stretch out my pension because there's that extra money there. Like I said, I want to save up for a cube cow because I think they're cute. I know everyone hates them, but I think they're absolutely cute. I'm looking forward to learning more things and moving on with Contact 21. Thank you. That's just one success story of the program, but uh, it's the human face. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Our next speaker is Dermot Cusson. Dermot commenced as the inaugural um, director of the Stratton Centre in June 2015. Prior to this, his Stratton role, he spent 13 years at the Department of State Development in industry and research engagement roles, which included approximately four years as manager of the department, uh, department's manufacturing unit. Before joining the state government, Dermot was, worked as an electrical engineer in the areas of product design, testing, development and application solutions for companies such as Gerard Industries, which is now Schneider Electrical, uh, Electric. Dermot has an honours degree in electrical uh, electronic engineering from Trinity College in Dublin. Welcome, Dermot. Thanks, Rob, and everybody. Um, I should have put some blue and gold on my accessory, pulling up from Aaron's comments earlier on. Um, a fair, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the, the Ghana people as the traditional owners of the land as well, and that we respect their spiritual relationship with the country. Um, there's a fair chance that uh, most of you in the room are probably only hearing about the Stratton Centre for the first time, given it's only two years old. So it's appropriate that I give you some background to set the scene as to why we're interested in the for-purpose economy. Um, so. Here we go, cool. Um, so the Stratton Centre um, was established uh, two years ago by the City of Playford, um, the University of Adelaide, and Renewal SA through funding from the Australian Government and the Playford Alliance Initiatives Fund. So our purpose is to explore and enable local jobs for local people. So basically jobs is our number one uh, focus, and then activities that fall under that, that bandwidth, such as training, education, that kind of thing. Um, how we do it basically is working with you guys, so tinkers, industry, networks, um, and, and government. So uh, collaborative relationships such as working with Paul and Housing SA, Business SA, Gala Business Development Group, Don Johnson Foundation, DSD. These are key relationships uh, for us. Um, we're located <coughs> in the, uh, the mighty suburb of uh, Monopara within the uh, Playford um, uh, Council area. Uh, we're 30 kilometres north of, of the CBD. Once the Nolan connector is finished and the Torrance of Torrance is sorted out, it'll be quite a pleasant drive and just exit off Curtis Road tomorrow towards Monopara. Um, that's the front of the building. It won the 2016 or 2015 public, South Australian Public Architecture Award. We're part of the Gig City Adelaide Initiative. You can see the, uh, the big G there lit up in the front of the building. Uh, we've also got our pretty cool uh, town park, which is embedded into the building. 
Um, talking about um, uh, you know, benefits for the community, I would like to thank um, SA Power Networks. I'm not too sure if there's someone here today, but they basically funded flood lighting for the skate park. So the kids can now use the skate park during, during the winter months as well. So that's a great initiative by, by SA Power Network. So it's a really cool town park, and it's pulling in people from all over um, Adelaide, really, not just within Playford. So how do we basically explore and enable uh, local jobs for, for local people? We, well, we go about it in a number of ways. One is, um, and it's really, really doing simple things well, as far as I'm concerned, but working with local businesses to help them grow. So last financial year, the team helped local businesses to employ 71 new people. Um, advocacy and case management is really important for us. So um, um, I've got City of Playford resources sitting in within the Stretton team, and advocacy is one of those key, key roles. So one of our guys basically works on advocating for social and economic and infrastructure projects within Playford and the greater Playford region. And then we also look at uh, case management as well. So where we have large projects that have got multiple touch points with council, we basically have one person managing that relationship, so we, we troubleshoot any issues and we manage those key, key relationships. Um, investment is another key area for us, uh, and especially working with the South Australian Investment Attraction Agency. So sometimes they'll bring opportunities to us. We'll work together in conjunction with, with planning. Planning has a key role to play in terms of business growth and expansion. Or sometimes opportunities come to us, and then we go to uh, the Investment Attraction Agency as well to see if we can just parcel things together. And then finally, delivering projects and initiatives from the Stratton Centre itself. So pretty much 25% of what we do is actually delivered from the Stratton Centre. And seeing as we are exploring and enabling local jobs for local people, well, we kind of need a tool to make that happen. So last year, we kicked off a, a, a jobs portal called Northern Adelaide Jobs and, uh, in, and with support from the Department of State Development. And that includes the uh, council areas of Port Adelaide Enfield, Salisbury, Playford, Tea Tree Gully, Light, Gawler, Adelaide Plains, and, and the Barossa. So I see Anne Moroni from RDA Barossa. So they've got a portal too, and they're in interconnected. They use the same platform, as does a platform that um, the Commonwealth government um, uh, developed for Holden workers uh, as well, so they're all connected. Um, to date, we've almost had a million views through this portal. Um, we know it's a community platform that operates nationally. Um, according to the developer, we're, we're pretty close to the top in terms of um, uh, platform successes. Um, last financial year, uh, 4,400 jobs went through the platform. Obviously, there's a big discrepancy between the number of views and, and the jobs, so clearly jobs is, is, a, is a major issue. Um, we've also got co-workers that work from Stratton across uh, a range of activities. Some are on, in the for-purpose uh, area. Uh, last financial year, three of those um, companies uh, took on um, uh, 11 new employees. One went from two to eight, outgrew the Stratton Centre and relocated to Anderson Walk, which is a 10-minute walk from, from Stratton, that's BT Group. Um, Housing SA is a, is a very important uh, co-worker uh, co and stakeholder with us, so we really value that relationship um, as well. We've also got a Northern Entrepreneur Growth Programme, um, again with some funding from, from DSD under the Northern Economic Plan, uh, thanks to Tony Piccolo MP, who's, who's quite active in our area, he's a great supporter. And that's been delivered in conjunction with Business SA and the Gawler Business Development Group. So again, helping companies to, to grow and, and, to, and to start. So we've heard why um, about the for-purpose economy earlier from, from Aaron and, and, and David, and it's the fastest growing area of the economy. Well, if it's the fastest growing area of the economy around jobs, well, we need to be involved. Why do we need to be involved? Well, you know, South Australia's, our Australia's unemployment rate at the moment is 5.9%, and South Australia sits at 67 so it's dropped a bit. That's great. Um, Playford sits at 14.5%, so there's a fair bit of work to be done. So if we can work in the for-purpose for economy to help facilitate and, and uh, support job creation, well, that's, that's brilliant. Um, I should acknowledge, too, my colleague Caroline Moylan, who's here today. She's sitting on table. I don't know which table you're on, Caroline. Uh, she's sitting on table number seven. So Carol, Caroline heads up uh, the work that we're doing across health, aging, and disability. So disability is a major area of, uh, of focus for us. Uh, and Caroline's doing a hell of a lot of work in that area, along with our colleagues in the city of, uh, of Playford. And she also heads up the work that we're doing in the area of uh, social enterprises, working closely with the Don Dunson Foundation, Housing SA, and, uh, and DSD as well. Um, some of the initiatives that we're going to look at in the uh, for purpose economy, including the Northern Social Economy Jobs Generator. I got it right, David. Um, so we're going to run a workshop on the 4th of October uh, in conjunction with the Don Dunson Foundation and the Northern Economic Plan. 
Um, it's going to be on from 2 to 4 o'clock. There's information about the workshop um, on the Stretton Center's Facebook uh, web page, so you can register for that, and you can also register for a, a networking event that's going to follow on from that. Um, a, a really valuable relationship, again, with Housing USA, um, and the project that we're working on is the Stretton Fellowship. So when the Premier was involved in the official opening of the Stretton Centre, he announced the Stretton Fellowship. It's funding that's delivered through the Honourable Zoe uh, Bedison, um, MP, Minister for Social Housing. Uh, and in conjunction with, with Housing USA, we're going to look at uh, where social procurement can, can facilitate um, economic participation and, and then looking at, again, opportunities around um, social enterprises. Um, Caroline is working with our colleagues uh, in the city of Playford around a, a social enterprise precinct concept. So uh, Playford has uh, various different properties. There's an opportunity on one at the moment. We've got a bit of space and potentially co-working organizations or social enterprises that might want to co-work together and uh, potentially not-for-profits in the, in the uh, for-purpose economy could come together. Uh, we're talking to Barcuma and the and Department of State Development around having a, a community cafe uh, run by people with, with disabilities. And there's some other spaces that might, uh, within this as well, that might lend itself to that kind of that, that, that's a social uh, enterprise for-purpose economy. Um, that's pretty much it for me. That's my our contact details. If you'd like to learn more, please talk to Caroline, and uh, she knows more about it than I do, I think, but uh, thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you, David. So uh, my pleasure now to introduce Sharon Brower. Um, sh under Sharon's guidance and leadership, Meals on Wheels SA harnesses the energy of more than 7,500 volunteers through 86 branch outlets to deliver more than just a meal to thousands of South Australians every week weekday. Since taking over the reins of Meals on Wheels SA in 2010, Sharon has positioned this iconic organisation to best deliver on the future changing needs of South Australians who, for many reasons, have difficulty preparing a meal. Sharon is Secretary of the Australian Meals on Wheels Association and a member of the Aged and Community Services Australian, Australia Divisional Council. She loves leading Meals on Wheels at a state and national level because their work tangibly nourishes the bodies and the souls of consumers and volunteers and strengthens the communities. Welcome. Thanks, Rob. A little bit of magic has just happened around this state. We've knocked on about 4,000 doors today, and at the door would have been two volunteers with a smile, a three-course meal, and making sure that the people inside uh, were, fit, were safe and well and well-fed and, um, and had some social connection. If you live in South Australia, you've probably heard the name Meals on Wheels. We're an iconic organisation. We've been around for over 60 years. Um, but most people only know the tip of the iceberg. So Meals on Wheels SA delivers over a million three-course meals to South Australians every year. And we do that with our 7,500 volunteers. We turn over about $12 million, and you could double that if we put a value on all the volunteer hours that go into our organisation. We support them with about 35 paid staff, so the ratio is pretty small. Our volunteers are organised into 86 virtually self-managed teams that we call branches, and they operate between Sejuna, Port Macdonnell, Renmark, Quorn, and, uh, of course, in the metropolitan area. Our vision is for well-nourished and independent communities, and that vision's been part of our DNA since 1954 when we were set up by a, a pioneering South Australian woman, Doris Taylor, and uh, the connection to the Don Dunstan Foundation was that our first state president was uh, Do a very young Don Dunstan, just before he was elected as the member for Norwood. Just like you, we're operating in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. And in fact, Mills on Wheels has probably enjoyed a, a level of stability greater than a lot of our uh, peer organisations in the for-purpose sector and certainly business sector. But change has been upon us and really over the last five or ten years is coming on at a rate that's very uncomfortable for a lot of Mills on Wheels volunteers and other stakeholders. So we've got a number of innovation imperatives, and the things that we're working on, as many of you are, are our service offerings, our revenue streams, our business processes, and our workforce. An example of where we're innovating around service offerings is a partnership that we have with SA Health 
and Asian Community Services Australia called Making Every Contact Count, or MEC. Now, I said before that Mills on Wheels knocked on about 4,000 doors today. We do that about a million times a year. So that's a million opportunities that Mills on Wheels has to make even more of a difference to the health and independence of people in our community. And Making Every Contact Count is about supporting our volunteers to have meaningful conversations with the people that they're visiting with some positive ageing and positive health messages. And uh, so it includes some uh, booklets and information that's provided and connecting people with existing services within the community. And we're doing that as a value add in our existing service model. We're not, uh, we haven't sought extra funding to do it and we're piloting it in four of our communities, two in the metropolitan area and two in the country areas, just to see how much of a difference it can make to those communities. And we think there'll be a knock-on effect that our volunteers, many of whom are about 10 years younger than the people that they're delivering to, that they'll get those positive health messages too. So Mills on Wheels, as a for-purpose organisation, uh, comes across some innovation roadblocks, and these wouldn't be particularly uncommon. There's something called the three C's of failure, conceit, conservatism and complacency, and Mills on Wheels had that in bucket loads up till about five or ten years ago. An organisation that started as one of the first social enterprises in South Australia uh, and was an incredibly innovative service model at the time in 1954, it's really hard to get people to shift out of the mindset that we are great at what we do, look at this, we're, we're, we've been successful for decades, we should just continue doing what we've always done and do it really well. And that is a, a really a challenging mindset to break in any organisation. We're also incredibly risk-averse, risk in fact, almost risk-paralysed. Um, we've got members of our board who really don't want to make mistakes. They don't want to fail. They don't want the good brand and reputation of Mills on Wheels to be tarnished by making an error of judgment. And they certainly don't want to waste resources on, uh, on new things that might be a little bit different than the normal uh, services that we've been delivering. And that follows through to our volunteer mindset as well. Many of them are concerned about um, imposing more responsibilities or tasks on their fellow volunteers. In an organisation like Mills on Wheels that has an ingrained culture of frugality, what we find is that business as usual burns all the fuel. We put all of our limited resources into continuing our business as usual, supporting those branches, recruiting more volunteers, recruiting more customers, improving the quality of our meals and services, and, uh, and that's it, that's as, that's as much as we've got the sort of the funding and the space to do. And it's not just about money, it's about headspace. And my leadership team and I are constantly sort of trying to take ourselves out of that business as usual, to have the thinking time and the creativity to look at how we can innovate. And we've got a large, dispersed and disparate workforce, primarily volunteers, hugely um, varied in their age, their ability and their capacity for change. So what are the innovation enhancers, or I like to call it the WD-40 or the grease that, that helps? What we've done at Mills on Wheels is to, this year is to be very intentional about innovation, and so that's being led from the board down. Uh, the board's actually repurposed one of its standing committees to focus on the future of Mills on Wheels. We're also creating the space to experiment. So within our budget, we've cobbled together a tiny little bit of extra funding to seed the um, grant writing, proposal writing, business case, you know, getting that next bit of money that we might need for a pilot project. And then we're also looking to connect with other organisations who have similar interests to us to see where we can partner. And finally, we're looking at um, co-design. So for us, co-design is as much about working alongside our volunteers to see what will work as it is about working alongside our customers. For years, we've been a very volunteer-centric organisation. We've shifted to a customer-centric organisation and we need to get better at working with not, the pe not only the people who use our services now, but those who could benefit in the future for us to achieve our vision of well-nourished and independent communities.
Thank you, Sharon. So that ends the uh, rapid fire presenters. I hope you enjoyed all of that and there's some, some great um, presentations in all of that. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Alison back to the stage and back to Adelaide. So for those who aren't aware, Alison uh, assisted hundreds of social ventures to become economically sustainable and increase their social impact. She is, has developed and, and helps lead the social innovation programs at the Mars Precinct in Canada. She's also helped grow the social innovation ecosystem through such programs as the so School for Social Entrepreneurs, is a sought after public speaker and has a significant impact on public policy. She's currently leading an initiative to develop a pro bono marketplace for Canada. Alison is also the social entrepreneur in residence in the Masters, Master in Business, Entrepreneurship and Technology program at the University of Waterloo. Um, she is an educator and mentor. She keeps Yay. doing great stuff. And this Yay. is why we <laughs> selected Alison. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we're running out of time and my bio's online and it's not that interesting. So I'm super thrilled to be back. Thank you so much um, for having me back. And I brought the sunshine. You're all very welcome. So uh, let me just talk a little bit. First of all, I bring you greetings from Mars. Uh, how often do you get that? Now, Mars uh, used to stand for medical and related sciences. It doesn't anymore. It's an innovation district. But 1.5 million square feet, which is about 140,000 square meters. I see um, We do metric in Canada, but for some reason or other, not about buildings. I don't know why. But you see the brown bit in the building. The brown bit, the brown building in the middle, is actually the Toronto General Hospital, which was decommissioned, and we turned it into an innovation hub. Think it's got any relevance for what's happening here in Adelaide? I don't know. Maybe could be something. And so I'm really keen to talk about that, and I'll get to that just a little bit later. And if you have any particular questions on Mars, there's lots of stuff online. And for those. My mic isn't working. For those who, no? OK, for those who've seen um, some presentations earlier, you're looking at me like it's not on. It's on. It's just moving around. It's moving. Should I stop? <laughs> OK. Um, can someone just do this if you lose me? OK, thank you very much. Um, so you'll, you'll see that what we're really are trying to do is we work in the area of health, uh, energy and environment, work and learning and finance and commerce, because those are the big areas where we think Canada's got a competitive advantage. What are Australia's competitive advantages? How do you do everything you can to focus around those areas? Pick the winners. And I know us nice people, Canadians and Australians, we're not that good at picking winners because it means you leave people behind. Pick winners. Figure out who you're going to back and get behind them and throw everything you've got at them. So we work on both the supply side, helping those ventures succeed, and we worked on the demand side, which is understanding the barriers to them getting to scale. That's another thing we need to do, right? We both have these huge countries with very few people. Let's think at scale, and let's think at scale right at the beginning. So when I was here last time, we came up with a, a, a great opportunity to meet with tons of people, and then we came up with recommendations. And I don't really like to call them recommendations. They're just kind of things for you to think about. Good enough? So one of the first things we did is say, what is a social capital ecosystem? What does that actually mean? And how do we understand who the players are and where the gaps are? So we had a fantastic workshop, and we're going to be doing another one again to accelerate that work. So I hope you can get engaged in that and think about understanding exactly the space that we're playing in. What's the business case? We've got to engage the corporates. We've got some great work from nonprofits, and you heard about the Deloitte folks. There is clearly a business case for engagement in the purpose economy. We've got to speak that language, and we've got to be pretty embracing of people that can come and bring new ways of thinking. So innovation helps corporates as they're exposed to nonprofits who are scrappy and can make things happen on the ground. And businesses being exposed to nonprofits works both ways, right? So you need to think about growing the innovation capacity of both. And that's exciting and interesting. Uh, we need to support the social capital folks here who are doing some very interesting work. Social capital, they're called lots of different things. But social capital, it's a, a network of, of people, and I hope you're getting engaged. Apparently, every time they have a, a function and event, more and more people come. So that network is really growing, which is a really good sign. Uh, you need to identify and support the intermediaries. Who are the intermediaries in this space? Because we do everything in isolation. We're in our silos. We look down. Who's looking up? Who's doing the brokering? Who's doing the partnering? We need to find those people. We need to support them to do this work. We need to share stories of success. 
So this is the governor, and people are very proud of his story as an immigrant and someone who became successful. And as David said, that's why we're having the showcase today. We need to tell our stories of success so we can build on it and create a sense of the possible. Uh, this is my brother-in-law who has Down syndrome. I don't know anybody who's not impacted by someone in their life, somewhere that's got some form of disability. The NDIS is a massive opportunity for all of us. We've got to see it as an opportunity. And you heard from groups today who have been incredible leaders in this space, not putting their head in the sand, but absolutely saying we need to get ahead of this. We need a vision for what a society could be and then we need to support the efforts of all of those people coming together around what that could mean for us. We don't want the tail wagging the dog. So it's up to the, us, those of us that are rooted in community, those of us that are impacted by folks with disabilities, which is almost everyone, and then we need to really take some leadership here and make it happen. We need to, we have these amazing post-secondary institutions here. How are we leveraging them? How are we absolutely understanding what students are demanding from post-secondary institutions? It is not your father's post-secondary anymore. Or even better, it's not your mother's post-secondary anymore. Millennials are demanding things in a new way, and we have to absolutely think differently about what post-secondary institutions are offering, not only in terms of job creation, but in terms of impact because people want to live and work their values. You want talent to come back to Australia? You want talent to come here to study? Offer them an opportunity to live and work their values. We need to build blended value startups. So the startup community is very interesting here. But here's an idea. Don't put the social impact folks in the cheap seats. Deal with them right up front. Say if you're beginning your, so, your venture, can we put that social impact lens on it? It's just like Moira was talking about with the gender lens. If you put a gender lens on things, you will open new opportunities. If you put a social impact lens, you will open new market opportunities and your business has an opportunity to be more sustainable. Don't make it an add-on. Put it up at the front. Public sector innovation. We have Gail here who's doing amazing work in this space. And Gail's not speaking this time, but she's right here. Say hi, Gail. Um, she, she's done some amazing, and you want to talk to her about opportunities for public sector innovation because she's all over it. And I think that's what we need to be really forethoughtful of because this state has a huge opportunity to be a leader globally. It's, you're so accessible. You all know, know each other. I know you all now, which is kind of awesome. So I think there's huge opportunities for you to make an impact and to really see that you as a citizen can make a difference. That's hugely important. Uh, create spaces for experimentation, right? Risk taking is hard. We're not trained to take risks. And in the public sector, we're often trained to say no. We're trained to do the exact opposite of that. What are the safe places for experimentation? And I'll just say I would love the raw to be one of those places, but I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, create receptor capacity. So we can't spend all the time just building all these cool, innovative things if there's nobody that's going to absorb them. What's the absorptive capacity that needs to happen so it can't be just the cool, bright, shiny object feature. We've got to figure out how to get them into the systems. There needs to be an absorption. There needs to be people like Gail who will take these into the public sector or people like Bendigo Bank who will absorb these new innovations and take them in. So we've got to think about that in a system-wide point of view. Demonstrating impact. We have an opportunity now with the sustainable development goals to speak the same language of everybody else who's doing this work. We need to think about and embrace those 17 particular areas and speak that language so we can do comparisons across the globe. We need to build the social capital talent. We've talked a lot. You've heard a lot about talent here today. There's an opportunity to keep the top talent and to attract new talent back. Huge opportunities. And we can do that by harnessing technology as well. We to think about the opportunities for technology in all of this. Uh, my colleague, Susie Sosa, who you heard about is our specialist thinker, talked a lot about picking a unifying brand for Australia. So you have many brands. Right now, we've got the whole festival thing going on, which is amazing. But this was a food and wine uh, program that I took a picture of last time I was here. What does it mean to be a test city? 
Like there's a lot of brands that you can grab, but pick one that's unifying. There's a real opportunity there for you to play with, or at least pick a brand hierarchy, which one is gonna predominate and when into which audiences. Growing the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So this is from Stratton and Holden, and they're thinking differently about how we create access to this entrepreneurial opportunity. So something you learned on the line, how do you reframe that as a business skill, a business that you can launch? And if you're gonna do that, you have to think about access to capital and what that looks like from startup all the way through to scale. Now my favorite part, creating and acting on a bold vision for the old raw. And I'm sure some of you heard the announcement about the state government uh, taking leadership on this. And I would say it's up to you. Decide what you are going to do and what works for your community. But if we have an opportunity for partnerships, for people to play in a real and meaningful way, then please take advantage of that. If you want an innovation district, one of the big things we learned about Mars is it can't be owned by any one sector. Innovation happens everywhere and it accelerates on the margins. Where are the opportunities for you to create those collisions? How do you take divergent thinking and bring it to convergent action? So I went back to first principles and some of the people that have inspired our work at Mars. The first one was Jane Jacobs, who was an urbanist, who said, old ideas can sometimes use new buildings. New ideas must use old buildings. She's pretty amazing. She wrote The Life and Death of American Cities. I encourage you to look her up if you're interested in urban issues at all. This was uh, one of the co-founders of Mars. It's amazing what you can get accomplished when you don't care who gets the credit. Think about that one. This is the CEO of Mars, Ilse Tronik, who says, as a chemist, I'm excited to see what comes from putting unusual elements together to form new combinations. It doesn't have to be the bright, cool new idea. It's about taking things that exist and putting them together in new ways. That is innovation. And you know I always have to have something from Trudeau. It's requirement. This is, like, this is what a prime minister tweets when it's not embarrassing. This is about inclusive innovation. Inclusive innovation in action. Microsoft projects making the world more accessible for those with disabilities. Inclusive innovation is the call. We want innovation that doesn't just help the 1%, but that lifts as it climbs. We need to think about the opportunities for inclusive growth. We need to make it work for everyone. And why are we doing all this? Because our future matters. And I was at a meeting this week with Ben, who brought Isabel, and it's for Isabel and all the Isabels in the room that we have a responsibility to get this right. Thank you all very much for your time, and I look forward to conversations later. Thank you, Alison, and we look forward to your three weeks with us again. So that brings us to a close. Uh, we're right on 1.30, so uh, I will bring formalities to a close. I once again like to thank all our speakers for taking part in today's event. Um, in lieu of speaker gifts today, IPA will make a small donation to each speaker's charity of choice through good thanks, so I thank you on their behalf. Uh, we'd like to thank and acknowledge the Don Dunstan Foundation and IPA, SA Management and staff who have worked together to deliver today's event. And I'd like to acknowledge the partners of the Social Capital Residencies and, and the event partners Deloitte and Carers SA. I think I got that wrong at the beginning. Hopefully nobody noticed, but it's Carers SA, wonderful organisation. I, I would like to thank IPA's other major partners, uh, the State Government of South Australia's Senior Management Team, PwC and Flinders University for their ongoing support. I also acknowledge IPA's professional members and counsellors. We appreciate your attendance today and we will be emailing you over the next day to seek your feedback on today's event. And thank you once again and enjoy the rest of your day.